Minister of Justice gives an end of year update about her ministry. Member of Parliament for the PFP says that her party has always advocated for timely, diplomatic and coherent communication. And Minister of General Affairs gives an update on where we are with the liquidity support. Those are the headlines for Tuesday, December the 15th, 2020. Season's greetings, everyone. This is SXM Daily News, and I'm Valerie from Putin. I want to thank you so much for joining me this evening. And as usual, we have a full newscast, so let's get started. In our first story, the House of Parliament sat in an urgent Central Committee meeting on Monday, December the 14th, 2020. The Minister of General Affairs, the Honorable Sylvia Jacobs, was present to give an update on where we are with negotiations with regards to the Netherlands and the third tranche of liquidity support. In her presentation, the minister updated the members with a PowerPoint presentation. The minister said that the points of concerns have been properly discussed and they have come to the end of these negotiations for discussions. She then presented the outcome of the negotiations. That we are in discussions with a team from Bezeka to come to agreements on the third tranche and mainly on the structural reform packages where we see possibilities to improve the administrative branch of government and the country in general. The points of concern have been properly discussed and we have come to the end of these negotiations or discussions. I'm now ready to present to you the outcome of these negotiations. I'll provide a quick outline of the relevant dates and events, the conditions that need to be met for further financing, the challenges that we are able or were able to resolve, and finally, to outline the possible benefits. Please bear with me as I will be sharing a lot of information in an attempt to provide the most complete and fair picture of what has transpired over the past few weeks with these discussions. On July 6, the Netherlands made an integral proposal for further liquidity support based on structural reforms which included the possibility of investments and other financing options. This proposal, this proposal was contingent upon agreement to a plethora of strict conditions including cost-cutting measures. Pursuant to Article 38, Paragraph 2 of the Charter, the countries were asked to agree to the content of the Kingdom Act on the Caribbean Organization for Development and Reform of Aruba, Curaçao, and St. Martin, hereafter called the COHO, and to submit the advice to the Council of State of the Kingdom. At this time, St. Martin and the other countries, Caribbean countries, were not ready to accept mainly due to the fact that the presented Consensus Kingdom Law violated our autonomy and other international regulations. Together with the other Prime Ministers, I traveled personally to the Netherlands to inform the Kingdom Council that St. Martin could not accept the proposal that was on the table. The government, supported by this Parliament, was allowed the opportunity to explore other possible solutions for our liquidity issues. We continue to highlight and bring attention to the fact that the Netherlands never issued the capital investment of 2019, some 60 million guilders, aimed at investment in our financial management and tax office, as well as the prison. We also made a counter proposal to the Netherlands in August, which was not even considered at that time. We also started the process regarding other options for alternative financing, which included the evaluation or the valuation of the government-owned companies for the purpose of possibly selling shares, which is not yet complete, by the way. And we also attempted to float a bond, or we did, for 75 million guilders, which had to be withdrawn after interference of the CFT and the lack of interest as a result thereof. In the meantime, the economic crisis continues as the entire world stood still and is still being held hostage by the COVID-19 pandemic. Other options were explored, but unfortunately did not pan out as planned for various reasons. 
All the while, St. Martin was in a constant state, or sorry, in constant discussions with the CFT to come to agreement on the application of the conditions for the second tranche conditions, which had been already agreed to. In addition, this government spent or sent several requests to be included in the negotiations on the Kingdom Law and even proposed adjustments under the title of open and honest negotiations as we felt that the discussions or the take it or leave it attitude was disrespectful to the islands in general. That is not how we normally come to a consensus. However, we were excluded because the Netherlands was not of the opinion that we had made even enough progress on the second tranche conditions. Aruba and Curaçao, who had also not yet completely fulfilled all their second tranche uh, measures, were allowed to start discussions on the third tranche and were able to come to amendments to the Kingdom Law that was initially proposed by the Netherlands. The version that the Netherlands agreed to amend based on the feedback from Curaçao as well as some input from Aruba, is what is on the table now. The Kingdom Law establishes, among other things, the existence and the authorities of the Coho, as it is now called. Also at the meeting was MP for the UP party, the Honorable Grisha Heiliger Martin, who came to the Prime Minister's defense. The Member of Parliament said that it seems that the Prime Minister is in a bind and she is running out of options. It also seems that she is in a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation, and she recapped what was happening at the meeting yesterday. It seems like our Prime Minister is in a bind. It seems like she's running out of options. It also seems as if she's in a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. We're just only one year under this Prime Minister's belt. She has been fighting for this country's livelihood in a healthcare crisis with the COVID pandemic, making attempts to secure and recover our economy, and to add insult to injury, she's now forced to battle to choose between obtaining liquidity support and giving up the democracy of this island. It's a crying shame that it has come to this, Mr. Chair. Let's recap exactly what is happening here today. A couple weeks ago, a couple days ago, a letter was leaked. A letter from State Secretary Knops addressing our Prime Minister, asking our Prime Minister the following. I have here an undated leaked letter, and in it, it says, on the political support, in our conversation on the 11th of November, I'm going to paraphrase because I translated it in English. I have already indicated that an agreement is only possible if there is sufficient political support for St. Martin, not only in the cabinet, but also in parliament, as you ask to clarify this in the form of a statement or motion by Monday, the 14th of December, at the latest. So that sufficient time remains to offer the RMR if all documents, all the conditions are met and the documents for the agreement is also sent in. This declaration or motion should show that there are no more inconsistencies with the motion of the United People's Party and the National Alliance on the completion or complete decolonization which was adopted on, in Parliament on the 5th of September last. He goes on to say, I stress once again that a motion or any kind of declaration of support by the state is a firm demand, he says, for me to come to an agreement. So what exactly is the State Secretary asking our Prime Minister here today? He's asking our Prime Minister, the State Secretary, who has no voting rights in the Dutch government, he's asking our Prime Minister to come to Parliament, the legislative body, the highest body in government, to pass a motion, and he's telling our Prime Minister what to put in the motion. That's what's happening today. Can State Secretary Knops go to the Dutch Parliament and ask them to pass a motion? 
Has that ever happened? Why is it happening here? Then he's also asking that we, the parliament, denounce the motion we passed November 7th. The motion on decolonization process. The motion where we said that it's going to be a long-term trajectory, that we're going to take our time with it. We're going to take our time and create an annotated document. And a, a few months down the line next year, we're going to present it to the United Nations. He wants us to denounce that. <coughs> August 2019, my colleague and good friend, MP Bossman asks State Secretary Knops, is Holland still obligated to finalize Article 73 for the CAS, Crusoe, Aruba, and St. Martin? Knopf said unequivocally, no. Holland is not obligated. So why in this letter, this leaked undated letter, why is Knopf not saying that we're not obligated to finalize 73? It's not even an issue because it's finalized. Why is he saying that? Why is he saying in this letter, stop it. Stop something that you say already done? Okay. Then you're asking us to stop the decolonization process where the main purpose of it is to pay close attention to the statute. Now, I'm going to show you here where State Secretary Clubs is a walking contradiction. Because looking at the statute is the main purpose of the decolonization committee, the Constitution and Decolonization Committee. We mentioned that in our presentation. We even highlighted a few articles in the statute that we find that is conflicting with international laws. This is not the first time Grisha Heilega Martin is saying that the statute has flaws. It's not Grisha Heilega Martin who started this, no. 65 years ago, 30 something, let's say 40 something countries had a fundamental problem with the statute. Meanwhile, Member of Parliament for the U.S. Party, Claudia Stonjaman Camper, who said that the meeting had many variants that truly needs to be looked carefully at, and what needed to be done also was for Parliament to take a formal stance on several of the issues being discussed today because the letters that have been in circulation for the past 48 hours paints a totally different picture. The MP expounded further. This meeting today has many variants that truly need to be looked at carefully. What must also be done today is for Parliament to take a formal stance on several of these issues as discussed today. I say this because the letters that have been in circulation for the last 48 hours have painted a totally different picture. Mr. Chairman, in July of this year, a mere five months ago, this parliament unanimously supported a motion to reject the Caribbean reform entity as it was presented to the country of Samantha at that time. Our Council of Advice had indicated that the entity as proposed could not be accepted as is, and so the Parliament asked our Prime Minister to negotiate a better position. Mr. Chairman, since then it appears much has happened. At least that is the primary, pri prim primarily based on what I read as Parliament in the newspapers, not firsthand as Parliament because we seemingly are not on the priority list to get information. This meeting today is a brilliant example. Letters were written the same way we could find to expedite the meeting today to come here. We could have found a way to expedite those letters to the 15 members of parliament. You're asking for our support on something we have no clue what's written. The coalition might have had that. I know you had a meeting yesterday at 5 o'clock, so I'm sure you all were briefed. But unfortunately, the opposition was not. And today, while I have always stated I consider myself Team St. Martin, I have been pushed in a corner to consider myself opposition in the Parliament of St. Martin. Too much is at stake today to play games. 
too much. Mr. Chairman, when I look at the work that the Minister of Finance has put in and try to make things work, but then read the CFT press releases, I wonder aloud where the truth lies. Somebody must be twisting the truth, and because I know better, let me say aloud that the CFT's eagerness to put Sir Martin down and undermine any efforts made is curious. And still to come, Member of Parliament for the PFP says that her party has always advocated for timely, diplomatic and coherent communication. I'll have a detail to that story and more when SXM Daily News returns. GEBE has been faithfully serving the communities of St. Martin, powering your home and our economy. Come rain or shine, our qualified team of professionals are working hard 24 hours a day to provide you and your family with safe, reliable electricity and water. We use the latest technologies and test our products daily to maintain the highest international standards. Our friendly staff is always there to assist you, whether in person, over the phone, or online. We are committed to constantly improving our products and services, making them more efficient, effective, and environmentally friendly to serve you better today and our next generation of clients tomorrow. GEBE, -E, powering a brighter future. Our friend Megawati is here with tips to save you energy. One, turn your air code temperature up. Two, use a ceiling fan instead. Three, buy energy saving products. Save some green with NVGEBE. And you are watching SXM Daily News, and I'm Valerie von Putin. As we continue now with more news, at the Central Committee meeting of Parliament to discuss the third tranche of liquidity support for the island, in her powerful presentation, Member of Parliament for the PFP, the Honorable Melissa Gump, said that her party has always advocated for timely, diplomatic, and coherent communication, and she has always pushed to be mindful of critical reality, not just here on our own 60 square miles, but of the reality that exists outside of the space from our neighbors to the north to the wide world beyond St. Martin. Prime Minister, through you, Mr. Chairman, when this COVID-19 saga began in March, it was cautioned that the economic fallout would be as great, if not greater than, the health fallout. With this in mind, as a faction, we have always advocated for timely, diplomatic, and coherent communication, whether from government to parliament, to the unions, to the Dutch government, or to the people of St. Martin. I personally have always pushed for us to be mindful of critical realities, not just here on our own 16 square miles, but of the reality that exists outside of that space from our neighbors to the north, to the wider world beyond St. Martin and the Caribbean as a whole. That has brought some confusing criticism to my door sometimes because the truth is, many times when you offer up constructive commentary and critical analysis on this island, you're met with some serious cognitive dissonance. People are confronted with the fact that sometimes the haphazard and often ad hoc way we have managed ourselves before and after 10, 10, 10 is not the correct way. This then causes a sort of collapse and then the defensive attitude pops up causing us to lay blame in an out of balance manner. Self-reflection and course correction has always been our most obvious weak points. And so now, in the face of a continuing global economic crisis, we are seeing some chickens come home to roost. When I read State Secretary Knops's letter, I was both angry and sad. I was angry because I felt insulted knowing that he has no business telling this parliament to pass a motion to indicate our support to government taking the deal. I felt that our word should be enough. If we tell the Prime Minister we've got her back, then what else is needed? A motion to solidify this report was not required of our kingdom partners in Aruba and Curacao, so why us? But then I thought, <laughs> that's right. A majority of the members of parliament made the conscious decision to send our government to negotiate with one hand tied behind your back and an eye patch. They did this with the November 5th ninja motion that was introduced 10 minutes before we were expected to vote on it. A motion that endorsed the often undiplomatic, tone deaf, and poorly timed actions and words of an external organization at a time when diplomacy is desperately needed. 
We aren't Nike. We have no business as parliament endorsing any external organization or person's actions or words. I say that because if this organization were to, I don't know, uh, stage a coup and walk into the government building and really show the prime minister what plata or plomo really means, which is silver or lead, money or bullets, that would mean that we as a parliament support that action too. That is the power of the word endorse. This is why words and their meanings and the possible consequences of said meanings are important. And hopefully with that, this is the last time we hear the words of Pablo Escobar in this honorable house, because the irony of quoting organized crime on this floor is actually making me cackle from a deep place. An independent member of parliament, the honorable Christophe Emmanuel, on addressing the same issue of the liquidity support said that he remembered the then prime minister saying, what is the entity and vehicle that will be used and where will this money be going? Why can't it simply be just like Hurricane Luis? He said, bam, what do we have today? The World Bank, the NRPB, this, that, and all sorts of different entities in this country. I remember the then Prime Minister saying, what is the entity that will be used? What is the vehicle that will be used? Where will this money be going? Why can't it simply be like how it was with Hurricane Lewis? I remember those things. And what it was back then? Oh, no, don't worry. We didn't think of nothing as yet. And bam, what do we have today? The World Bank. NRBP, this, that, all sort of different entities in this country. That's what we have today. But what did St. Martin get? What, what, what is it that we received? We have given up everything. According to my colleague, Ms. Martin Heiliger, the only thing she took off yet was a branch right to the crowd. But everything else we has given up. We have given. We have given. That's all we continue to do as a society, as a country, is to give and give and give. What have we received today from the 550 million put in the trust fund, put at the World Bank's disposal for us? What have we received? Absolutely nothing. Four six roofs being put on. No, but let's, let's, let's think about it. Let's think about it. The integrity chamber is functioning today. Masha Shays can board all the yachts and everything because of border control that they have today. What do we have? We still have sunken yachts in the lagoon. We still have roofs that need to be repaired. We still have schools that need to be repaired. We still have nothing. We have received nothing. But today I receive this. The coho, the hoard, whichever one it is. Whichever one it is. And we are entertaining the discussion that it's, oh, my back is against the wall and you know, it's best to feed our people and no, absolutely not. And I've listened to previous MPs spoke before. So, and they haven't said it, but I will say it. It doesn't have my support. Now, turning to our weather forecast for December the 15th, 2020, a slack surface pressure gradient will cause light to gentle winds. Low moisture levels in the atmosphere will continue to restrict precipitation, despite the presence of a multi-layered trough. Seas will peak at seven feet before subsiding tomorrow. Small craft operators and sea bathers should continue to exercise caution. So the outlook through Thursday midday, fair to party cloudy with a brief local shower possible. Now let's turn to your three-day forecast. And still to come, Minister of Justice gives an end-of-year update from her ministry. I'll have the details of that story when SXM Daily News returns. Innovative Banco Matico contactless smart card. 
Your Banco Medico Smart Card is now equipped with a contactless feature for payments, so get ready to tap and go. Contactless payments are fast, easy, secure, and accepted worldwide at all Maestro-enabled contactless terminals. Tap for transactions equivalent to or less than 100 NAF, or the U.S. dollar equivalent. You will receive notifications via email anytime you tap. Tap, tap, and pay fast, fast with WIB. For more information, visit our website at wib-bank.net. Tap and go with your partner in progress. Welcome back, viewers. And as we end this edition of SXM Daily News for this evening, the Justice Committee of Parliament met in an urgent meeting with the Minister of Justice, the Honorable Anna E. Richardson, for an end-of-year update from the Minister on Monday, December the 14th. In her presentation, the minister pointed out a number of issues and challenges she faces with the various departments that are in her portfolio. The minister said that prior to taking office as Minister of Justice, she had some knowledge as it pertains to important items that were left unfinished in the Ministry of Justice. Since then, she has developed a deeper understanding of the depth and complexity of these items that was not completed since 10, 10, 10 and have made a commitment to not only in word but also in action to finally solve these issues. The minister then gave her presentation of what she has committed herself to work on. Prior to taking office as Minister of Justice, I had some knowledge as it pertains to important items that were left unfinished in the Ministry of Justice. Since then, I have developed a deeper understanding of the depth and complexities of these pressing items that were not completed since 101010 10, 10, and have made a commitment to not only in word, but also in action to finally solve these issues. Among those, and what remains my top priority, is the Ministry of Justice Function Book. Often when persons hear about the Function Book, they are, they are under the impression that it is just the function book of the police force of St. Martin. Fact of the matter is, the function book in question is for all nine departments that fall under the Ministry of Justice. Those being Staff Bureau, Judicial Affairs, KPSM, Immigration and Border Protection Services, National De De Detectives or Lancer Sheja, Prison and House of Detention in the Mislali Center, Court of Guardianship, Customs, and the Financial Intelligent Unit known as MOT. To establish the function book of the Ministry of Justice by national decree, there are three key phases which are broken down into 14 steps. These three phases are to establish the information, type of functions, and full-time equivalents or FTAs. Outline the job description per function, value the functions, and the salary scale. So one, to establish the formation, type of function, and full-time equivalents, meaning the FTAs. Two, outline the job description per function. And three, value the functions and salary scales. Through you, Madam Chair Lady, for the sake of clarity, it is important to note that the following trajectory that I will share is specific to efforts to finalize the function book of CAR-PSM only. That means the remaining eight function books for the department within the departments within the Ministry of Justice were not being processed until now with the installation of the project group. December 2018, a draft description was approved by the department head of CAPSM. And with that, viewers, it brings us to the end of this edition of SXM Daily News for this evening. I am Valerie von Putten and just want you to know that I will be off for the holidays and will be back in early January. I want to wish you and your family and friends a happy and safe holiday season. Thank you so much for your support this year. Please adhere to the COVID-19 protocols that are in place and please keep safe. And just a reminder that this and other programs are available online. Simply log on to stmartinmediacenter.com for viewing. And on behalf of the SXM Daily News team, we thank you so much for watching and plan on meeting you right back here again next year in 2021.